Well, as if we haven't looked at some and created some really wild graphs lately, we're going to finish the chapter off with our wildest ones yet, and that's going to be our inverse trig graphs. And so before we actually start building the graphs, I want to go over some notation. Um, so there's two, alt two ways that we could say um, each of these. And the first one is you may see it written as y equals arc sine. Oh, goodness. Let's see. Okay, there we go. We got the pen working again. Could be arc sine of x or it could be sine inverse of x. And I want you to feel comfortable with both forms of notation and recognize that they do mean the same thing. We've got y equals arc cosine of x, which could be rewritten as cosine inverse of x. And then the last one's arc tangent of x, which of course could be rewritten as tan inverse of x. All right, a couple of key components here today that I want you to really emphasize in your notebook. When you see this negative one on these rascals right here on these functions, that negative one is not an exponent. All right, and I know it's going to be tough to tell, but just basically every time you see a negative one up there on these trig functions, assume that it's not an exponent. In fact, that negative one is a symbol that means inverse. Okay. Negative one is a symbol that means inverse, and I want you to really make this uh, well documented in your notebook. And the other thing I want to really emphasize here is that an inverse is not the same thing as a reciprocal, okay? Not equal to reciprocal. That's the other pet peeve that I have um, on this topic is I don't want us to think that they're one and the same. These two words are not synonymous. They do not mean the same thing. They're entirely different. And hopefully by the end of this lesson, we can appreciate the difference. All right, one more uh, discussion here before we start building these graphs is, you know, what is an inverse anyway? We spent a lot of time on inverses back in the fall. And basically, to summarize that chapter, we said, all you got to do is switch the x and y values. And if you can do that, you've created an inverse. Um, for instance, um, if a comma b lies on the original graph f of x, then we automatically know that the ordered pair b comma a lies on the graph of f inverse of x. Okay, so let's go over a few examples here. Maybe my original function f of x uh, was x squared. In other words, y equals x squared. Okay, let's try to generate some ordered pairs that sit on that graph. Um, we know that the point um, 1 comma 1 sits on that graph. We know 2 comma 4 sits on that graph. We know 3 comma 9. We know that 4 comma 16. And we could keep going on and on, but I think that's enough to kind of get us started. Now, what do we know about his inverse? Um, we would use this notation. We would say f negative 1 of x. Um, and now the inverse of 1, 1 is still 1, 1. Nothing changed. But the inverse of 2, 4 is now 4, 2. The inverse of 3, 9 is now 9, 3. And the inverse of 4, 16 is now 16, comma 4. And basically, to summarize, what happened was every x value became a y value, and each y value became an x value. They just switch or flip-flop. Okay, we're finally ready to start graphing um, an arc trig graph here. We're going to start with arc sine or y equals sine inverse of x. And, and the whole essence of all inverses is that the x and y values switch places. So you'll notice how I changed labeling my axes. And we're going to do a rough draft and then we'll clean it up and we'll do a clean, good copy. But you'll notice uh, instead of labeling the x-axis in terms of pi, we've now labeled the y-axis in terms of pi now. Look at right down the y-axis. And now the x-axis is labeled in terms of whole numbers, and I just went, uh, I just labeled negative one and one. That's all we need. We don't need to go any further than that. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I've imported a picture of our regular sine curve up here, and I'm, what there is is there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine really special points. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the inverse of each of those nine points and transpose them over to this graph. Um, and for instance, the, let's start right here at the origin. The point zero, zero, the inverse of that is, well, you guessed it, zero, zero. So we still go through the origin. Um, working on the positive direction first, pi over two comma one. His inverse is going to be one comma pi over two. And I'm going to go to the right one, up pi over two. Um, my third point right here is pi comma zero. His inverse is going to be zero comma pi. So it's zero pi's right there. 
My fourth point is 3 pi over 2 comma negative 1. His inverse would be negative 1 comma 3 pi over 2. All right, so we go left 1 up 3 pi over 2 right there. And then my last, my fifth one there, 2 pi comma, oops, 2 pi comma 0. And his inverse would be 0 comma 2 pi. And it's going to put me right up there. Um, now, let's see, if I work backwards here, negative pi over 2 comma negative 1, negative 1 comma negative pi over 2, okay? Negative pi 0, 0 negative pi. Uh, negative 3 pi over 2 comma 1, his inverse would be 1 comma negative 3 pi over 2, and then we'll finish right here. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to try to connect those points real smooth here, the best that we can. Kind of... So that's what our arc sine or inverse sine graph looks like. Now we have a fundamental problem with this rascal right now. The question becomes, is our graph a function or not? All right, and how do you know if something's a function? Well, the easiest thing to do is to um, apply the vertical line test. And as we apply that vertical line test, whether you draw a vertical line down here or whether you draw it over here, I think we quickly say that this is not a function because it fails the vertical line test with multiple intersection points. So what we have to do is we have to restrict the domain of the sine curve so that his inverse becomes a function. And in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to put um, a boundary line at pi over 2. And what we're going to do is we're going to erase everything above pi over 2. We're also going to put a boundary line at negative pi over 2 and erase everything below there. All right, and what you have left is just this little snapshot of kind of a squirrely graph, but it does pass the vertical line test now and is a function. So that's what I want to do is I want to uh, create a clean copy of everything we have after we did some erasing. Okay, so now we want to clean up that arc sine graph. And what I want you to do is I'm going to go up three units on the y-axis, and that's going to be my pi over 2. That's my highest point. I'm going to go down three units. This will be negative pi over 2. I believe I went over four units for 1, left four units for negative 1. That's not as important. But the key is we know we've got to go through this point here, this point here, and this point here. And now I don't want to connect these points with a straight line. I've got to think of the curvature that we had on that graph just above. And as I connect them, I'm going to start down here, and I'm going to be concave down. Okay, do you see the curvature? We're concave down, and then we have a point of inflection at the origin, and we now switch and we become concave up. And this is what the official arc sine or inverse sine graph looks like with the restricted domain. And I'll just make a little note here. We're concave down, and then we're concave up. And let's just say what they're going to do is they're going to ask you a certain question, and they're going to ask you, what restrictions do we need to put on the sine curve so that his inverse is a function? And here's what I'm going to say for the sine curve. All right, for y equals sine, we're going to say that the domain needs to be restricted to all x values that fall between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Okay, that's what we call a restricted domain probably heard me say that a few times and now we just want to write it out. That's a restricted domain. All right, now the restricted domain on cosine on the next slide is going to be slightly different, so we're going to have our hands full trying to keep them separate. All right, we're going to try to attempt to draw y equals arc cosine here of x, uh, which could also be written as y equals cosine inverse of x. And what I've done is on the left side here, I've sketched the cosine curve. We know that it starts high and finishes high. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take like the five most significant points on this graph. We'll call it point A. That's, uh, what would we say, that's 0 comma 1. So what we're going to do is the inverse of that is 1 comma 0. And that's the first point I'm going to plot over here on my inverse graph. The second most famous point is pi over 2 comma 0 whose inverse happens to be 0 comma pi over 2 and that's going to be right here the third most famous point is pi comma negative 1 whose inverse is negative 1 comma pi and I'm going to plot that right there um, let's see the fourth most famous point is 3 pi over 2 comma 0 whose inverse happens to be 0 comma 3 pi over 2 and 0 comma 3 pi over 2 is right there. And then last but not least, that's 2 pi comma 0 whose inverse is, or I'm sorry, that's 2 pi comma 1 whose inverse is 
1 comma 2 pi. So right now we're going to just connect this with a nice smooth curve. All right. Now we're going to try to see the pattern and predict where it's going to go next. It's going to come back down to negative power 2 and then dip here, cross the y-axis and then finish up here. So we'll just finish drawing this. Now just like the last one, we have a monster problem with this picture. What's wrong with this picture? Well, no matter where you draw a vertical line, it's easy to convince yourself that this graph does not pass the vertical line test. So the way that we see it right now, it is not a function, and that's a big problem. That's a big problem. So we have to, again, restrict to the domain of the cosine function so that his inverse does indeed become a function. Now what we're going to do on this particular one is we're going to erase everything above pi. Okay, so I'm going to, everything that's above pi, I'm going to erase. And then everything that's below zero or below the x-axis, we're also going to erase everything there. And now I'm going to import a new piece of graph paper, and I'm going to have you guys do a fresh, clean sketch in your notebook as well with the new uh, polished version of our cosine. Okay, so I'm going to go up three blocks, and that's going to be pi over two. I'm going to go up three more blocks, and that's pi. I'm going to go right four for one unit, left four for negative one unit. All right, now what does that arc cosine graph look like? Let's see, he started right here, and then at pi over two, he crossed the y-axis, and then at pi, they finished at negative one. Okay, now the curvature again is very important. Starting in the upper left-hand corner, we're concave up. Once you hit pi over two, that's a point of inflection. We're gonna switch concavity, and we're gonna finish concave down. So we'll put a little note here, we're concave up, and then we're concave down. That's gonna help you really nail these graphs. This is a final picture of the cosine inverse graph with the restricted domain. And again, one of their famous questions on the exam is they're gonna ask you what kind of restrictions we should put on the cosine domain. So if you consider the original cosine graph, um, what should his domain be? Well, we're going to say all x values such that 0 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to pi. And if we restrict the domain of cosine to that interval, his inverse will be a function. And again, that's what we call your restricted domain. And notice it's you know significantly different than the domain um, on the sine curve. And so we're going to have to keep them separate from one another. All right, our third and final graph is we're going to try to do uh, inverse tan or arc tan of x. And before we do that, I want to just review how we go about drawing the tangent curve itself. Um, we've got pi over 2 here, and we've got pi, and then we've got 3 pi over 2, and then we've got 2 pi. This is uh, certainly the most challenging one. We know we've got asymptotes at pi over 2, and then we've got another vertical asymptote at 3 pi over 2. We know we've got roots at the origin at pi and at 2 pi, and then we're concave up. Let's see, we're concave down, switch, concave up, and then we're concave down. And so this is what the original tangent graph looks like. And I'll try to graph some of these. Now, the biggest key is that whenever tangent has a vertical asymptote, um, his inverse is going to have a horizontal asymptote. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put horizontal asymptotes at pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. Um, also on the negative side, we're going to have one at negative pi over 2 negative 3 pi over 2. All right, and now we're going to pick a couple of the famous points. Do you remember what this famous one is right here in the middle? Um, that's pi over 4 comma 1. So his inverse is going to be 1 comma pi over 4. Now remember, pi over 4 is right in the middle, so I'm going to go over 1 to pi over 4. And, um, and the same could be said for the negative version. Negative 1, negative pi over 4 is right there. We also don't want to overlook the fact that it does go through the origin, and the inverse of that is also 0, 0. So what we've done is we've created a graph that goes through the origin just like such. Now what's going to happen is the graph's going to continue to repeat that pattern over and over and over again. But I think you'll agree with me that this bear with all of these curves on it is not a function. It doesn't pass the vertical line test. So what we're going to do is we're going to erase everything above pi over 2. Everything above pi over 2 is going to get erased. Everything below negative pi over 2 is going to get erased. So now we have just one cycle that will pass the vertical line test. So let's go do a nice clean version. All right, so we're going to label these axes. We're going to go up three units. That's pi over 2. We're going to go down three units. That's negative pi over 2. 
we say, okay, there's one left four, there's negative one. Now the most important thing for arc tangent or inverse tan is to get those asymptotes in there. So first things first, draw your horizontal asymptote at pi over two and at negative pi over two. Okay, and then we know the graph is going to go through the origin. It's going to go through one comma pi over four, negative one comma negative pi over four, and then we're just going to be real careful with our. Um, we're going to be concave up. We're going to have a point of inflection at the origin, and then we're going to be concave down. But it's real subtle. It's real subtle. And one of the things I'll do is I'll probably we'll probably embellish that concavity just a little bit. We want to make sure we're concave down there, concave up right here. And, um, and, and several times we, we will embellish this a little bit just to show, emphasize which way it's going. Um, what's the restricted domain on tangent? That's probably the number one thing we need to know. We're going to say that if you consider the graph of tangent, his restricted domain needs to be all x's um, from negative pi over 2 less than x less than pi over 2. Now notice it looks like it's the exact same as arc sine but it's not quite. I didn't say less than or equal to. If you look at these little symbols right here we don't have the equals to like we did just because there's asymptotes there and we technically are not, don't exist at the asymptote. So it's very similar to sine but not the same and that's the restricted domain on tangent. So the number th one thing I want you to appreciate before you come into class tomorrow is the restricted domains which allow those inverse functions to actually be functions so that they pass the vertical line test. And if, you, um, if we have a general feel for these graphs and we know the restricted domains, you're going to be in great shape tomorrow. So good luck. Um, replay the video and catch those domains if you didn't catch them the first time. And we'll see you tomorrow.